Christians must do more than just fight the bad ideas of the sexual revolution. We have to care for the victims of those bad ideas, especially kids. For the Colson Center, I'm John Stone Street. This is Breakpoint. In Tuesday night's State of the Union address, President Biden told young people with gender dysphoria that he would, quote, always have their back. He didn't exactly specify what that meant, but presumably it has something to do with extending Title IX protections that would allow men full access to women's facilities and sports, extending mandatory insurance coverage for so-called gender reassignment surgeries, and restricting any and all counseling treatments or public advocacy that does anything less than fully affirm one's gender dysphoria. Now, what makes it so likely that the president's late speech shout out referred to these sorts of extreme policy positions is that it was quickly followed by a call to pass what's called the Equality Act, something that remains, at least for now, dead in the Senate. The Equality Act would be a kind of legislative nuclear option. It would render the 250 or so so so-called anti-LGBTQ bills under consideration currently across America pointless and it would lead to serious restrictions on religious liberty, especially for religious schools. Over the last few years, following a strategy that proved effective for advancing pro-life protections, states like Texas have been laying creative groundwork that would hold adults accountable for experimenting on young people who are struggling with gender identity. Having these laws in place is incredibly important, especially given the astronomical rise in the number of young people identifying as transgender and just how quickly transgender ideology has gone from being unthinkable to unquestionable across so many aspects of our society. For example, the field of so-called gender-affirming medicine, which is the only example of medical treatment in which the body is reoriented to the mind as opposed to the mind being corrected to align with biological reality, well, that was a $300 million industry back in 2018. By 2026, it's projected to be a $1.5 billion industry. Now, children in particular are the subjects of this kind of social experimentation, which is only one example of how reality has been reimagined along the lines of sexual autonomy. If the early days of the sexual revolution were primarily about being free from the confines of sexual morality, well, these latter days are about being free from the confines of sexual reality, and that these created realities were part of a biological, social, and religious package deal went largely unquestioned until quite recently in human history. However, technological innovations like the pill, IVF, and surrogacy, as well as legal innovations like no-fault divorce and cultural innovations like ubiquitous pornography and hookup apps, these have all made it increasingly easy to reimagine the world along the line of advancing our sexual happiness. And children are just forced to go along. Pursuing social and legal equality without reference to reality has proven even more disastrous. It's one thing to say that men and women are equal before God and the law. It's quite another to say that they are the same. Or, like we are today, that any and all difference is either an illusion or unjust. So now we talk without a hint of parody that men can bear children and that not all women menstruate and love can make a second mom into a dad. Now, none of this is true, of course, but young people are just expected to play along, to adapt and to adopt these lies, and then to pretend that all is well, even if it's not. Now, of all the lies of the sexual revolution, that one's the most devastating, because it was repeated at each new stage of the sexual revolution, in some form or another, in order to justify whatever way we were going to reimagine life in the world. Here it is. The kids will be fine. But of course, the kids haven't been fine, and they're not fine, not even close. In her book, Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement, Katie Faust documents all the ways that the kids aren't fine, all the ways their well-being is being sacrificed on the altar of adult happiness. In just a couple weeks, Tuesday evening, March 15th, I will be talking with Katie Faust about all the ways that the kids aren't fine, and how Christians can and must take steps to defend children from the myths, the misnomers, the lies of the sexual revolution. This isn't a theoretical topic. In fact, I'm absolutely convinced that standing for the inherent dignity and rights of children against the innovations of our age, well, that's our version of running into the plague and caring for its victims while everyone else is running away. It's what we're called to at this cultural moment. Katie Faust's presentation will be part of our new Lighthouse Voices speaker series, which is a partnership between the Colson Center and 
focus on the family. We aim to help Christians think clearly and biblically, especially about the most critical, confusing, and important issues that lie at the intersection of family and culture today. So if you're in the Holland, Michigan area, you can join the conversation in person. If you're not, you can sign up for the live stream of this important discussion by going to colsoncenter.org slash events. That's colsoncenter.org slash events. For the Colson Center, I'm John Stone Street with Breakpoint.